One of the greatest rewards we encounter in our travels across America's heartland is meeting ordinary people who are doing extraordinary things in life. On a recent concert stop in Michigan, we met Joaquin Guerrero, a police officer from Saginaw, who has dedicated his life to making a difference in the lives of young children. Along with this police dog rookie, Officer Guerrero has developed Precinct 131, a program that's designed to help the kids in the inner cities fight the devastating effects of gangs. Officer Guerrero believes that the time that he has invested is worthwhile, even if he's only able to save the life of one of the children that he has met along the way. My name is Joaquin Guerrero. I was born and raised in Saginaw, Michigan. Um, and I'm a police officer with the Saginaw City Police Department currently. I started working with the Saginaw City Police Department back in 1989. Started out as a patrol officer working the general patrol, city streets of Saginaw. Um, in 1994, I was promoted to a detective and was working with the FBI and the Federal Gang Task Force. Um, sh shortly after I you know, got my new position, um, we had to go to another a special school, which was uh, Canine, Canine Academy. Um, the school that I went to was located down in Romulus, Romulus, Michigan, and it was run by Terry and Diane Schobach and uh, Terry Foley. Well then, in, 1990, in 1998, that's when I developed Precinct 131, but I was still going in the schools with the dog, so I took the concept of, hey, I got a dog, I got to do demos. I did uh, gang education, so I combined the two, and then in 1998 is when Precinct 131 became official as a nonprofit organization for, to say no to gangs, guns, drugs, and violence. So when I did Precinct 131, my goal was to target the, the kindergartners through fourth grade because there wasn't really nothing going for the children at that, that level. Because an important child is that they're our future. So if we don't invest in our future, how are we going to have a future? Well, a lot of times, and people know that in order to get funding, you're going to have to have it. Well, the grants, you have to apply for grants. I'd apply for several grants, some you would get, some you wouldn't. So I had to think up fast, how am I going to keep this program alive? Because it wasn't funded through the police department. It was funded out of my pocket, out of my own money, out of my own pocket, and what I could do through grants and through the sales of t-shirts, hats, um, rookie dolls, rookie puppies, canine puppies. Um, I went to the to think of even doing rookie cookies. How the puppet came about was, like I said, when I started Precinct 131 in, in, in 1998, um, I noticed that they never, they didn't have a German Shepherd dog. They had hounds, they had uh, mixed like mutts type dogs, all cats and that, but they did not have a, a German Shepherd police dog. So I contact Puppet Productions and, and, and we were on the phone for about a good 20 to 30 minutes with this guy. And he goes, you know who I am? And I'm like, I'm just thinking this is a sales guy. He says, well, he's, they're, they're gone right now. And I just happened to pick up the phone. He says, I'm the president and founder of Puppet Productions. And I go, oh, really? He goes, uh, did you ever hear of Gilbert, Gilbert the Puppet? And I says, yeah, he's big in the, the, the church Christian type thing. He rides a little bike and he's Gilbert the Puppet. He goes, did you ever hear of McGruff? And I go, oh yeah, everybody knows McGruff. He goes, well, I created those puppets. He says, and I'm gonna create your dog as a puppet. I like your concept. And then that's how the Rookie Puppet was developed. And they made it based on Rookie the actual police dog and now that puppet's used through puppet productions to be able to um, sell for people to use. Now there's a German Shepherd dog based on Rookie. What I noticed is going into the, the elementary schools, I noticed that a lot of where we were from, and, and, and some, you'll notice that some children, they're afraid of the police. And, and it depends on the, the area that they're in and they're just, they've always had, could have had a bad experience, their family could have, so they're kind of a little bit intimidated by the police. But what I noticed with Rookie, when I would go into the schools, they weren't, there was a bridge there. So the dog actually built, built a bridge between the child and the police officer. And I started noticing that the young children were coming up saying, Rookie, you gotta come into my neighborhood. So-and-so's dealing drugs. Can you help make my neighborhood safe? Well, then they'd start rattling names off. Well, I'd recognize these names. And there was that bridge that we had, we had built between there. And then I could give the information back to other guys on the street saying, hey, so-and-so's working in this area. If I heard something, say, yeah, from what I heard from a child, they're in this area dealing drugs or starting their gangs up. If I remember right, it was one of the schools at Stone Elementary School. And a young, a young boy asked me, he says, uh, made the question, do you, do you wear bulletproof vests? And you say yes, and you kind of hit on your chest like this, and it knocks on it, because they had the, the, the vest itself, it's real stiff, you know. And then I had another young, child was female goes 
what about the dog? So now this is a good question now. You're going, well, yeah, what about the dog, you know? So he says, well, hon, it, it's very expensive. At that time, they were very expensive vests for them. They ran about seven, $800 per vest at that time. Well, the students decide to get together and want to, to make, raise some money for the bulletproof vest for both Mohawk and Rookie. Well, shortly after that, there was, uh, we had this during the middle of the week, there was, uh, the, they were raising this money throughout this course of the time. Well, it was during Thanksgiving time, Mohawk, which would be Rookie's uh, brother, half-brother, was working at the time we were on the streets working, and Officer Vasquez got dispatched to one of the Meyer stores that had gotten robbed out in Saginaw Township, and they had come into the city of Saginaw. Well, our officers had picked up on this vehicle fleet, and there was a short pursuit, and Mohawk ended up getting shot in the process of them apprehending the bad guys. Well, that happened on Thanksgiving, which was on a Thursday. Shortly after that, during the weekend, the money that they had raised um, had, was some kids had broken into the school and stole all the money that was being raised for the bulletproof vest. So now we had two also, we had another individual that had given, it was, for, it was she was a kindergartner girl, and she had donated her money that she had saved for four years to go to Disneyland, and that money had gotten stolen. And now the community came together and decided to raise the money to get the two dogs their vests. It, it touched me, it, it, it literally touched me because you very seldom see kids do something like that at such a very young age. Yep, 9-11, I think that's a, a day in history that everybody's gonna remember and not forget. And you could say, I was this and this, doing this such and such this day. And I remember I was in court and everybody was saying, hey, a plane just crashed into the towers. You know, I'm kind of watching this, and by this time I'm heading back home. So I get home, and mom and dad are there at the house there. At that time, they were staying with us. And uh, I turn on the TV, and I'm watching, and then you've seen the boom, the second one go into it. And I'm like, holy smokes. So right away, I started getting on the phone to emergency management. And that would be where they they're actually in charge of what's going on because at that time nobody knew what was going on when, they, with the, when the towers had come down. We didn't know how many casualties we had and so it was just a total sheer chaos. How I got through to the phone lines to them, I do not know this day. It was the Lord that just opened that door for me to be able to contact to, those, to that individual because to be able to just call is just, I mean that's not like one in a million chance that was meant to happen. So make the phone call. And then shortly afterwards, this is we, it's when they're saying, I told them who I was and that I had a, a police canine and that, you know, do you need help? And he says, yes, we do. Get down here as soon as possible. Um, after, after checking in, um, you're, you're sitting off to the side because there was still so much debris they couldn't have. They, they weren't, there were areas we couldn't get into, so we had to wait till a lot of the big equipment could come in and, and move a lot of the debris around. And while we were sitting there, um, you, found, you found out that there was other responders that were coming in from out of state and then someone asked you where you're from. And I remember one gentleman told me, I says, well, I'm from Michigan, you know? And I says, really? You know, he says, yeah. He says, you, you came all the way from Michigan here? I says, well, you would have did it for my state if it happened to me. And, and he was a New York officer. He says, thank you, thank you. And I says, hey, I'm, I'm here to help. You're, you're, we're all, this is our country. We gotta take care of our, our own. So we're working, as we're working down through there, start talking to some of the workers, and I noticed the workers starting, you know, one, they start marking themselves, they write their social security or their name on their leg, their arm, or on their stomach and that, and, and what that was for in case something happened, if a cave-in or something happened to you, you were marked. Um, as I'm working down there, I remember being down there, and one of the battalion guys that was in charge of us, where we would meet up at, 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 at Ground Zero, there's like a check-in spot there. You'd sit there and, and they'd say, what's your name? And I says, my name's Joaquin Guerrero. And they're like, what? I says, Joaquin Guerrero. He says, where are you from? I go, I'm from Michigan. Well, you're calling you Michigan now. You get there, it's actually get a police escort right down there. Everybody was meeting at Giant Stadium. Then from there, we got a police escort right into Ground Zero. And I, I think when I remember going down, driving down through there, there were people like just clapping and applauding you because you know they see the dog, it's marked, the canine unit going down through there, and they're they're handing stuff through the windows to you, but water bottles, throwing gloves in, giving you stuff, you know, yeah, you know, and, and, and to say you know they're 
you're a hero and that. I'm like, hey, I'm not a hero. You know, the hero is those guys that ran into that building. Them are, them are the heroes. You know, that's that was, you know, and that's what was kind of really hard for me to, to bring in. But when we hit ground zero, when I got down there, I remember getting out of the vehicle with the dog and it dropped me right to my knees. I'm like, oh my God, Lord, what am I going to do? He says, trust your dog, I'll do the rest. It, it, it's so hard to explain because, I mean, until your TV and, and what you see on the footage just doesn't do it because it, it, the large amount of vast destruction that was caused by when the towers came down is just it's incredible. People don't realize that a 16-acre radius that we were dealing with, we had a 40-foot high pile, seven-story deep hole that, that were, what we were, and then the buildings that were destroyed in there. Um, after checking in at the high school, you would then be deployed out to where Zero was at, whatever, the North Tower or the South Tower. I was at uh, West and Vesey sector, which would have been the North Tower section area. We'd go out there and I'd check in with them. And then they would yell, dog. So then we would have to walk this gauntlet, which was like, called it the Bucket Brigade. Because what would happen is, is you'd have a row of two people, which would form like a, an, a, a row with a, a two on each side, but it was just a lengthy snake that would, you'd see just snake all the way up to where they were going and what they would do is they'd have empty buckets they'd be passing up and then they would be buckets that were filled with debris that would be coming down the other side and then they would pile it up and then they would have a, a truck or something would sift, take that out and then that would go out to Fresh Kill Island where they would sift it and check it with other canines for any in case there was any any human remains that were that were missed or grabbed by mistake. As we were walking that gauntlet you, you would hear fellow officers, volunteers and, and it was very, very hard because they're 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 like you gotta find my my dad, my mom, my brother, and you know to sit there and they're calling like you're you're they're giving you the and and, and your everything slows down in slow motion. As I was walking that you could just I could it was like just time was starting to slow down. You'd see them kind of doing the thumbs up like this to you, the smell, the sounds, the it was everything was just so overwhelming that it was just. You, you would never forget it. And you know, there's times where I'd be walking and I'd have tears, you know, because these guys are, you know, patting you on the back and that, and, and you start clearing that area and the dog would indicate, and then they'd have to come in and, and remove the, the remains. But that, that, that was very hard having to do that for, you know, walking that, that gauntlet that bucket brigade gone and, and even to this day I can't stand orange buckets because that's all you've seen there from that were donated through a lot of the places and it just you know don't it just brings back those those memories you know was like a workhorse he just kept going and going and going and uh, and even when we got off the pile after working the ground zero for 12 I mean 12 hours could be 13 14 hours just depending you know you would just stay until you and you didn't want to quit because you know you were there was closure for families and, and you're, you're looking for possibly having a survivor in there but when we would come off the pile um, there'd be gathering spots where you'd sit and talk and, and kind of work with or share with other workers that were there. And then when we'd come down, they would, Rook would go up to these guys and, and the firemen that were there. And these guys would just sit there and, and just talk to Rook. And yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna find my, my buddy or, you know, just whatever they were releasing, all this, this hurt that they had through these dogs. And, and, and Rook was actually a certified therapy dog. Same with his sister, Felony. So they were, they were right down in the midst of that working and you could see it. You'd see them, they'd give them water and they're just, just petting the dog and loving on him and hugging on him and he'd lean up against them. Some you'd see cry, you know, you'd see emotions come out. Um, and it was there, you, you could see healing, some type of release of, of getting that, what they were holding, the hurt that they were holding inside them. Shortly after, you know, we got, we pulled out and came back to Michigan. Um, I still wanted to, I still had to help these people. And, and my fellow brothers, you know, police and fire and, and the, the New York people itself. So I actually came up with an idea. I said, how can I still help the citizens 
in New York while I'm still here in Michigan. The Lord gave me a dream of doing a patch. It was a 9-11 patch. And the proceeds I did, I sold those patches and that money went back to the families that were there. So I was still able to help. And I felt that was, that was healing for me. About two years, about, I'd say around two years later, it was like around uh, November of 2003, around Thanksgiving time, um, I had taken Rook in for his yearly checkup. Well, this is sometime around, I want to say towards the end of January, I think it was, or middle, just before in January, they get back, I get a call as I'm getting ready to go into work from my vet. He says, hey, Joaquin, the, um, the results are back in. And I'm like, oh, okay. And he says, well, I wish I had some good news for you. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He says, ah, Rookie's got cancer. And he's, I, he's got a tumor the size of a lemon, Joaquin. That's the infection we were fighting. And I says, how long? And he says, we don't know. It could be tomorrow. It could be week, month. And it just, it's like me, somebody telling your child, she's got cancer, he's dying, I don't have children. My dog was mine, would be like compared to a, to, my, to a child for me. I'm like, wow, you know. Well, that kind of set some flags off in there because now these were search dogs and now they found one that had cancer. So Imes says, we're going to save this dog. So Imes jumped aboard and started, let's see what we can do. And then they got the ball rolling, and then they sent me to some specialist, and they had to take with the, the MRI. It was like a mapping of everything of what that dog is. I mean, you're, I mean, to the right minute thing. So that gave them a mapping of that, and then they found the surgeon, and they sent us in. And even then, you could see where Rookie was. I mean, he was he was depleting bad because he'd get better, then he'd go down, he'd get better and go back down. And um, so we went through it, and then shortly right after that, you know, Rook went through his checkups and stuff, and then. So I kind of noticed something when we went in to get his yearly checkup again. They felt a bump again around his neck and his, his by his glands areas, and they ran some X-rays, you know. So I'm figuring, oh, maybe it's just a, it's a fatty tumor or something like that. And, and you know, you you get that scared feeling, and anybody who's gone through having somebody that has cancer can relate because you're just you don't know. And when that cancer came back, it came back with vengeance. Like, how dare you stop me the first time? And um, Rook died. He ended up having, I had to put Rookie down um, June 30th. And uh, it's the hardest thing to have to, because Rookie, he didn't die in the sleep, his sleep. And I'm thinking, oh Lord, just take him in his sleep. But having to walk my partner through, and I remember he got out of the police car, I remember that, day I, I put him in and we had picked the day the vet they were all waiting for us there and we get him in I get him in the patrol car and uh, he's kind of like looking at you and, and you're like gosh I, you know you don't want to do it and we're driving by and I remember there was a traffic stop officer had a car stopped on the side of the road and we're driving down there and I for us we pull up next to that that officer and, and you look at him and Rook pops up because you know we'd always would do that and the dog kept going all the way till he was I mean we're walking to, I have to put my poor guy down you know stood up and that officer looks at me and uh, he gives a thumbs up but that means I'm okay we're all set and I remember Rookie just standing up and like sitting up in there looking at that guy and it was like his last time he checked on a fellow brother you know and we get to the vet and I remember walking him out and I I, I took him out and broke him one last time which means so for him to go to the bathroom and that, and I'm casting them around, and everybody's there, mom, dad, you know, family was all there. Um, and uh, we walk him in, I remember walking in the vet and all the vet techs that had treated him for years, they see him, and the big thing what happens is, is these dogs walk up on that scale, they're so used, so he jumps up on the scale, you know, and he gets his last weigh in and everything, and then the vet comes out, and when you see that, that needle with that, that pink juice, you know, you know, you're sitting there, and uh, I remember him, delay him, they're sitting there, he's sitting there, he was already starting to get really weak in that, and you could see him, we're starting to, to shake, and kind of trying to stand up and fight it, and I had his ball, and he's like looking at me, and the, the vet, that's when he injected him, and I sat there with him all the way to the end, and, and yeah, and you know, I just, I whispered in his ear, he says, well, I, I told him, it's time to go home, buddy, you, you, you did your job. 
I says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done. You did what you were supposed to. Rookie was remembered just like any police officer would, would, would be remembered with honors. Um, he had his 21-gun salute. He had his fellow brother canines come in from all over the state of Michigan. And we met in an auditorium. It was open to the public. So because Rookie was a community dog, I made him a community dog. He was, I'm just the caretaker of him. This is what the taxpayers paid for. This is their dog. This was a, the, the community's dog. In Rookie's lifetime, and when he went into there, Rookie touched over a quarter of a million children going into these schools. And even then, when he was gone, he was still touching people's lives. And it was hard because when I'm standing there and these, they do that procession of these dogs marching by and these guys are saluting you, it, it was tough. You know what I mean? And then you see the, 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 the video that they did for Rook, the, the PowerPoint presentation and that, and all of what he's done in there and how he was honored and the 21 gun salute and the taps that they did and, and also the bagpipes. It just did a lot of closure for, for people and for because it was their dog. He was a community's dog. I think it's fair to say that America's canine police dogs are many times the unsung heroes of our communities, the eyes and ears of the night, and positive role models for our youth. As Officer Guerrero says about Rookie, he respected all and feared none. Now Rookie too takes that motto and works alongside his partner once again, serving as guardians of the night. We would like to express a heartfelt thank you from all of us here with Hidden Heritage and Brulee to the canine handlers and their partners across America. And I thank you for allowing us to bring recognition to one of our Native American heroes. I think what keeps me going and, and doing the job that I had to do, um, over 21 years ago, you know, I applied to be a police officer with the city of Saginaw. The city of Saginaw didn't go knocking on my door. I went knocking on the door of the city of Saginaw. And this is my way of giving back to my community and serving them. And right after Rookie died, I was able to get Rookie 2. And Rookie 2 was a uh, a healing for me for Rookie 1. It took me over about a year and a half to get over Rookie 1. Even though I still had, had Rookie 2 with me, Rookie 2 was there and because and, you're so used to working with the one partner, you have to be fair about it with the dog handler because when you get a new dog, you can't expect him to be the same. So you got to let him develop and be his own self. So now I'm learning to work with this dog and still being fair about him because a lot of people says, well, he's got some big shoes to fill. He says, well, he'll do it. Because you know what, I can't sit there and, and, and treat him like, expect him to be like that because he's his own, each dog has their own different personality. I can't change that dog's personality. You know, the first rook I had a Dean Martin. I got a Jerry Lewis now. <laughs> you know, I owe it to my, my city and my state and my country. I mean, if it ha something happened here or any other, I'd be the first one standing in line running in. Let's go. Let's take care of this mess and let's clean it up and let's move on.